Suppose you are moving down the freeway late at night at 70 miles per hour and then suddenly there is a large deer in your path. Needless to say, you might not come out too well in the deal. The deer, of course, got away. All moving objects have what Newton called a quantity of motion. That quantity of motion is called momentum. Momentum equals mass times velocity. We use the letter P for momentum. And since velocity is a vector, momentum is a vector as well. It has both magnitude and direction. And you have to pay attention to the directions. If we think back to Newton's laws, in his first law, an object in motion, or at rest, will remain in motion, or at rest, unless an unbalanced force acts upon it. And in Newton's second law, an object's acceleration produced by a net force is proportional to that force and inversely proportional to its mass. So, if we think to F equals MA, and then remember that A, the acceleration, is just the change in velocity divided by the change in time, and then do a little bit of rearranging, we have F delta T equals M delta V. Well, MV is momentum, and so M delta V becomes M delta P, or a force applied for a certain amount of time will change the momentum. A change in an object's momentum is equal to the force used to change that momentum times the duration of the force applied. We call that change in an object's momentum the impulse momentum theorem. The change in an object's momentum is equal to the force used to change that momentum. The F delta T is called the impulse, and we use the letter I for impulse. So the impulse, F delta T, equals the change in momentum. Please note that the change in its linear momentum is considered to be in the same direction. Let's look at an example of how this works. <clears throat> in a crash test, a car of mass 1500 kilograms collides with a wall and rebounds as in the figure. The initial and final velocities of the wall are vi equals negative 15 meters per second, negative because it's going towards the left or the west direction, and the final velocity is positive 2.6 meters per second because the car rebounds back towards the right or the east direction. If the collision lasts 4.15 seconds, find the impulse delivered to the car due to the collision and the size and direction of the average force exerted on the car. So again, the impulse is related to the change in momentum. So let's look at the momentum before. PI, the initial momentum, is MVI, which is the 1500 kilograms times the initial velocity of minus 15 meters per second. And we get negative 2.25 times 10 to the fourth kilogram meters per second. Kilogram meter per second is or are the units for momentum. Okay, how about the momentum after the collision? Well, it's mass times the velocity after the collision. So now we have the 1500 kilograms again, the 2.6 meters per second, this time to the right, and gives us a positive 0.39 times 10 to the fourth kilogram meters per second. So the impulse is the change in momentum. So it's going to be MVF minus MVI. Don't forget direction here, OK? So this was going in the negative direction for our, our initial momentum. So it has the negative sign, and we're subtracting. And so that becomes an add, and we end up with a total of 2.64 times 10 to the fourth kilogram meters per second for our impulse. And the answer to part A. And then, don't forget that the impulse is force times 
delta t or the time of the collision. So if we take our impulse and divide by the time, then we can get the force that was applied to make the car rebound. And so 2.64 times 10 to the fourth kilogram meters per second divided by the 0.15 seconds. Notice that now our units will be kilogram meter per second squared, which is a Newton. So we have 1.76 times 10 to the fifth Newtons. And again, direction matters, VI and VF were not in the same direction, and that's why we had a ended up with an add here. It's a very easy mistake to be made. Okay, now you've heard of conservation of energy. We also have conservation of momentum. In an isolated and closed system, it's isolated because we have no external forces, and it's closed because there's no change in mass in the system the total momentum of the system remains constant. This is called the law of conservation of momentum. Basically what it means is the total momentum before something happens, say a collision, and the total momentum after have to be equal. It has to remain constant. So imagine we've got two objects, M1 and M2, moving towards each other. They're going to collide, just as we had with the car on the wall a moment ago. Now, from Newton's third law, the force of the collision of the object on the left must be equal and opposite to the force of the collision of the object on the right. In other words, when these two objects collide, their forces have to be equal but in opposite directions, the old touch and be touched portion of Newton's third law. Then after the collision, the two objects start moving off in the opposite directions. And since the amount of time of the collision has to be the same for both objects, they were both part of the same collision, then those two forces, the one from object one into object two and object two into object one times delta t has to remain equal, but again, opposite direction. If we start with the impulse momentum theorem, F delta T equals M delta V. And again, think of the change in momentum, M delta V as being MVF, final velocity, minus MVI, the initial velocity. And then think about our two objects that are about to collide. The impulse for object one would be F21 delta T, which is M1V1 final minus M1V1 initial. That's the change in momentum for object one. Object two, M2V2 final minus M2V2 initial, and those have to equal the impulse of that collision. And again, those are equal, but in opposite directions. So a little substitution, M1V1, M1V1 here, and then the M2V2s over here, but don't forget the negative sign, and then doing a little bit of rearranging we have M1V1I plus M2V2I, which are the momentums before the collision, has to equal M1V1 final plus M2V2 final, which are the momentums of the two objects after the collision. So we had a collision, and the momentums before have to equal the momentums afterward. Now that doesn't mean that all the velocities remain the same, it just means that the combination of M1V1 and M2V2 for the initial case has to equal the combination of M1V1 and M2V2 for the final velocities. So let's look at an example of that. An archer stands at rest on frictionless ice and fires a 0.25 kilogram arrow horizontally at 100 meters per second. The combined mass of the archer and bow is 60 kilograms. With what velocity does the archer move across the ice after firing the arrow? So we think of, again, our before, M1V1I and M2V2I, and our after, M1V1F and M2V2F. So please note the archer and bow, 60 kilograms, the arrow, 0.25 kilograms, but their velocities are initially zero because they're not moving until he fires the arrow. So initially they're all at rest, so all of this is going to be zero. Uh, 
That has to equal the 60 kilograms of the archer and bow times whatever velocity they're moving at and the 0.25 kilograms and the 100 meters per second of the arrow after it's been fired. So a little bit of rearranging and we end up with our final velocity for the archer and the bow of being negative 0.417 meters per second. Negative because it's moving in the opposite direction from the, uh, the one that the arrow was fired at. So the archer will slide in the opposite direction from the arrow at a velocity of 0.417 meters per second. And just as a reminder, the momentum is zero if nothing is actually moving. Now, we can have what's called a perfectly inelastic collision. An inelastic collision is when the objects stick together after the collision. The total momentum before and the total momentum after still have to be equal, even though the two objects are now stuck together. So, if we consider our momentums before, we have m1, v1i, and m2, v2i. Those would be the momentums before. The momentum after, well now that they're stuck together, we treat them as one, so it's m1 plus m2, the total mass of them stuck together, and then we have one vf because the entire thing is moving as one. And again, uh, You'll have to pay attention to signs when you actually plug in your numbers because V1 and V2 are moving in opposite directions. So, let's look at an example. An SUV with a mass of 1800 kilograms is traveling eastbound at 15 meters per second, while a compact car with a mass of 900 kilograms is traveling westbound at 15 meters per second. Note, however, it's negative 15 because it's going westbound. The cars collide head-on, becoming entangled. What is the speed of the entangled cars after the collision? So, now, the SUV, 1800, its initial velocity, 1500, or 15 meters per second. The uh, compact 900 kilograms its initial velocity in the opposite direction and then the two masses together times their final velocity that's what we want to solve for the final velocity of the entangled pair so rearranging we end up with the final velocity of the entangled cars will be 5 meters per second and in this case it is a positive five meters per second so it is moving in the eastward direction. Momentum before, momentum afterward. Now we can of course have collisions that are not simply in line. In other words we think of them as 2D collisions where they can move in either the X or the Y directions though most likely going to move at some diagonal to that, and so we have to think in terms of components. For a general collision of two objects in two-dimensional space, the conservation of momentum principle implies that the total momentum of the system in each direction is conserved. So in other words, we have to do this in both the horizontal direction and in the vertical direction. And so we use some subscripts, the X's and the Y's, to distinguish uh, between which directions we're talking about. So this is that same equation we were looking at before, but we have affixed X's to the uh, subscripts so that it's the momentum before for V1 or M1 and M2, the momentum afterwards for M1 and M2 in the horizontal direction and then the same basic equations but now in the y direction. So you can imagine M1 runs into M2, M1 moves off in uh, a diagonal in that direction, M2 uh, moves off in that direction after the collision. The stationary billiard ball mass 0.17 kilograms is struck by an identical ball 0.17 
moving at 4 meters per second. After the collision, the ball initially moving then moves off at an angle of 60 degrees to the left of its original direction. The stationary ball, the one that was originally stationary, moves off at a 30 degree angle to the right of the moving ball's original direction. And so basically you had a ball that was moving, it hits another ball, the first ball moves off at 60 degrees up here. Uh, if we look at that direction, then that would be to the left of that direction. And then the ball that was stationary moves off this way at 30 degrees. Uh, all the balls have 0.17 kilograms as their mass. So in the x direction, the momentum before has to equal the momentum afterward. Ball two wasn't moving initially, so there's no momentum for it before. It's just the momentum of ball one, m1, v1, ix. Again, we're going in the x direction. And then we've got m1, v1, fx plus m2, v2, fx. So the final velocities of ball one and ball two after the collision. Now, since all those masses are the same, they all cancel out, and we're left with v1, ix equals v1, fx plus v2 fx but it turns out that because this sets up a right triangle in this particular case notice the 1630 so that would be a right triangle and also if you think in terms of cosine cosine of 60 would be the adjacent over the hypotenuse or the final v1 fx has to be v1 cosine theta and same thing for v2 it's moving in that direction, but it would be the adjacent over the hypotenuse for cosine. We can write all of these in terms of that initial velocity. V1 times the cosine of 60 plus V1 times the cosine of 30. And so we end up with the final velocity for ball one after the collision was two meters per second. And the final velocity of ball two after the collision was three and a half meters per second. And of course, please note that this is a right triangle, and so Pythagorean would still hold. 2 squared plus 3.5 squared should give us 4 meters per second squared. So, conservation in the x direction. Let's look at a second example of 2D collisions. This one, an inelastic one, which means the uh, in this case, the car and the van are, are going to be stuck together after the collision. So a car with a mass of 1,500 kilograms traveling east at a speed of 25 meters per second collides at an intersection with a 2,500 kilogram van traveling north at a speed of 20 meters per second. Find the magnitude and direction of the velocity of the wreckage after the collision, assuming that the vehicles undergo a perfectly inelastic collision. So. Momentum in the x direction before equals momentum in the x direction afterwards. Uh, in the x direction, only the car is moving in the x direction, so the van, van was going north, so it's not east or west, so it's not included in the before. They become entangled, so take their masses together times some final velocity in the x direction. And that final velocity in the x direction will be the ratio of their masses times uh, the velocity in the, the initial velocity in the x direction. Likewise, the y direction, the, the momentum before, the momentum afterward. But now only the van was moving in a north-south direction. So initially, only the van's momentum is being included. The car did not have any kind of momentum in the y direction initially. And then they became entangled, so our masses are again together, times their final velocity in the y direction. And again, the velocities of the other object, the van in this case, didn't move east-west. The car in the second case didn't move north-south, and so therefore um, those are zero. So a car traveling with a mass of 1,500 kilograms traveling east, as we said, we can go ahead now and solve for VFX and VFY, plugging in the numbers. So the mass of the car over the mass of both of them, 
times the 25 meters per second, which is what the car was moving initially, gives us 9.375 meters per second. In the y direction, we have the mass of the van over the mass of both of them times the initial velocity of the van, 20 meters per second, and that gives us a final velocity in the y direction of 12 and a half meters per second. Well, we've seen these guys before, VFX, VFY. So we can find the final velocity, uh, and actually a little typo there, I shouldn't have the Y, just VF. The VF is just gonna be uh, the squares and then square rooted. And so the final velocity will be 15.625 meters per second. To do the angle, tangent inverse of the Y over the X components, and so 12 and a half over 9.375, take tangent inverse, and we've got 53.1 degrees. So our final velocity, and again, not in the y direction, just our final velocity was 15.625 meters per second at 53.1 degrees north of east. And so an example of an inelastic 2D collision.